friends in Christ, may the promises of Christ, may his love, may his mercy dwell within your hearts, reassuring you of his grace. Amen. Real, authentic, trustworthy. Things that we like to see, that we like to hear. When you go into the grocery store and you're shopping and you look on the shelf, you don't go for the thing that says made with artificial flavors, but you seek out the thing that says real cheddar cheese inside, real fruit juice. You seek out those things that are natural. Just look at the markets lately and how many people buy organic groceries. They talk about these things that are supposedly better for us. They don't have as many preservatives. The eggs that we buy, the, the meats that we buy, they're better for us because they're real. It's not just food that we prefer real things. We like real people as well. People that we can identify with. People who don't speak out of both sides of their mouth. How many of you, if you think about it, have friends that you would call friends who are hypocrites? Not many of you, right? Because they've offended you, they've lied to you in some way. And I wonder if that's why we seek so many things that are meant to be real, authentic. Things that we can bite our teeth into, that we can feel, that we can touch. It's because we've had so many people tell lies to us. We've had so many people mislead us. It doesn't have to just be politicians or news pundits, as many people point their fingers to, but even people close to our homes, people in our families, people who we should be able to trust. So many times we hear these lies that it makes us wonder what is, in fact, real. And think about not only the people, the foods, the, the drinks, but church. Don't we want our relationship with God to be real? We want our relationship to, with God to be authentic. We want the time that we come together and worship to be something that, that inspires our hearts, that we leave here with a plan of attack against this world. We want to hear hymns and songs that remind us of God's grace, of his power, of his mercy. We want to hear a message that isn't just droning on and on and on and on and on and on, but speaks to where we're at in our lives. We want to go forth, and we want our prayers to be things that change the world. And so often, so often we struggle when they're not. So often we struggle when we don't see these real fruits of our faith. We struggle because we, we expect it. We expect to see this real faith. And so we long, and we wait, and we think to God, how much longer, Lord? As the, as the disciples stood there today, they had a question in their hearts. Lord, will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? Will you now restore your kingdom on this earth? And don't we ask the same thing? How much longer, Lord, will you allow the sinners to exist? How much longer will you allow those sinners to take control? When will you reestablish your country, your people, your nation? Wow. And in the face of that, face of that, that is what we need when we need real Real faith. Faith that is not something that we only talk about, but faith that we experience. Faith that is not lost in the clouds, waiting for what could be. Faith that is not lost here on earth, forgetting that there is what is to come. But faith that is living and breathing in our hearts. Faith that is existing. But so often we struggle because we throw around that term of faith and we don't even know what it means. We don't even know what it means to say that I have faith. If someone were to walk up to you today and they said to you, what is different about you, Christian, that you are a person of faith, what would you say? What would you say to them? Would you quickly change the subject? Hopefully they'd forget. Would you point to someone else, someone who has lived a real life of faith? Would you be able to look at your own life and say, this this is where I've seen faith alive and living in my heart. This is where I've seen faith alive and living in what I do and what I say. But so often we struggle. We struggle even to define faith. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11, he gives us a very succinct, although maybe somewhat difficult definition of faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Not a lot of clarity in that statement, is it? 
we still struggle because we still sit here and we say, well, I know faith is about trusting God. I know faith is about holding to God in the midst of troubles and holding to God in the midst of the joys, but but what does it mean to completely and totally trust God? What does it mean to have real and authentic and living faith? And we struggle to answer that question. And we struggle to answer it whether someone puts us on the spot or not. And we're left with questions. Much like the disciples, we're left with questions. The disciples, as they stood there, they didn't have all the answers. They stood there and they stared up into heaven and they thought to themselves, what now? And so God gave them the answer. Not maybe the one that they were expecting. Not maybe the one they thought they needed, but the one he knew they needed. And that was to go. Go and live your faith. And what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us as we sit here today, as we, the people of God? Well, it starts out with the reality of faith that we don't have all the answers. We don't have every answer, whether it's in Scripture or whether it's out of Scripture. We don't have the answer to why creation was able to happen in six days and God to rest in seven days. We don't have the answer as to how God can dwell within our hearts and dwell within heaven. We don't have the answer of how he could die on the cross, taking on human form even though he is God, who is omnipresent, present everywhere, eternal, not bound by time. We don't have the answer to that. We don't have the answer to how he is able to be present in the Lord's Supper. We don't have the answer to how he can provide forgiveness through baptism. But we do have his answer. It is faith. Trust me. Trust me, God says to us over and over again in Scripture. Trust me, he says. And you may not have the answer of how. You may not have the answer of why. I know I don't. And that is why we have to have faith. The assurance of what is hoped for, what is not seen. The assurance that he is in control. The assurance that he is all-powerful. The assurance that he has not left us here by ourselves. Real faith is about admitting that we don't have all the answers. It is admitting that when someone is in trouble, we don't have the answer as to why. It is admitting to that family, there's a Christian family who lost their son in that Boston Marathon explosion. And they're probably asking that question of why, but admitting that we don't have the answer to that. There's many Christians who ran in the Boston Marathon, who lost arms and legs and were hurt very severely. Why? We don't have the answer to that. But God's answer is, trust me. Trust him. Because he is God and we are people. And that's a hard thing for us to do, even if you're a seasoned Christian. It's hard for us to say, I don't have the answer to that question. It's hard for us to say, I don't know why God allowed that to happen. But I will continue to trust in him. I will continue to cling to the promises in his word. But that's hard for us. That's hard for us because we do want to be able to explain what is happening. We do want to be able to tell people, this is why. We want to be able to call God to account when he has done something that we don't expect or think he should. But we're not God. We're not God and we are his people. We are his people who are forced to trust in him and trust in the promises he's given us. We are his people who who, who cry out for real faith, something authentic but sometimes find ourselves straying further and further away. Find ourselves saying prayers that are just repetition from yesterday, simply words that slide out of our mouth so easily. We find ourselves as Christian people who come together and worship, lifting up our hearts in prayer and praise and finding an anchor there, weighing them down. We find ourselves listening to a pastor preach who seems to browbeat us and discourage us instead of uplifting and encouraging us. We find that worship becomes an obligation instead of an opportunity. We find that even sharing our faith becomes a burden on our lives. One more thing that I have to do instead of saying it's something I want to do. And think about it in your own lives for just a minute. Think about your prayer life for just a moment. Do you really consider your relationship with God a real relationship? 
as you take time? Do you take time in prayer? Or is prayer a passing thing that happens when you have a moment? Do you take time to to think about your actions, the way you live, the way that you behave towards others, the way you speak to them? Does it reflect God living within your heart? Think about the way that you look at worship, the way that you treat worship. Is it a reflection of God's love for you, the mercy he has shown you? So often, we as Christians, as we look at our own hearts, as we look at our own lives, have to admit that, well, sadly, we are inauthentic. We are those who are unreal. We talk of faith, but we don't live our faith. It's an accusation that has been made by those outside the church. They've looked at those in the church and they said, I thought you were supposed to be different. Are their accusations right? I'll let you dwell on that. Because as we think about it, as we think about real faith, We know that it is not bound up in words alone. It is not bound up in us attending church. It's not bound up even in our reading of Scripture. It's not bound up even in, in our prayer life. It's all those things and so much more. Because our faith life, our faith life, is a complete reorientation, a complete change of what the, wor- the way the world looks at things. It's looking at the world through God's eyes, not our eyes. It's looking at the world with God's heart, not our hearts, our sinful and corrupted hearts. And we know, we know that it is impossible for us to do this on our own. We know that it is impossible for us because no matter how hard we try, even if for a moment we can do well, that old sinful pride just sneaks right back in our hearts and reclaims the spot it had. We notice time and again we're bombarded by those attacks of Satan. The desires of the world swoop in and they they call us right back away again. And that's why it is by grace. That is why it is by grace that we are given our faith, that we are saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, probably a very familiar verse to most of you, but Just something I want to look at in in the details once again is, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not just the gift of salvation, but it is the gift of faith. It is the gift of faith that the Holy Spirit has given to us. It is not a commitment we make. It's not a commitment our parents make as they bring us to the waters of holy baptism when we're infants. The gift of faith is the working of the Holy Spirit within our heart. The gift of faith is the working of the Holy Spirit. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet dead in our trespasses, it is the Holy Spirit working on our hearts, convicting them and changing them, reorienting them to see our God. Our God who is the real gift of salvation. Our God who truly and really and bodily took on human form. Our God who really and truly and bodily confronted sin with his death on the cross. Our God who really and truly and bodily rose from the grave. Our God who really and truly bodily ascended into heaven. And our God who really and truly and bodily will come again for each one of us. Our resurrection, our promise, our faith is not merely bound up in this disembodied spirit, this idea we're going to float around with heaven with harps, but we are going to be given new bodies. We are going to be given new life because as Jesus rose from the grave, as he conquered death. That is the hope we have as well. We will conquer death. We will conquer it and when he destroys this heaven, when he destroys this earth, he will give us new bodies and new life when he creates the new heaven and the new earth. And this is not merely something we are hoping for, but this is a promise. This is a promise of our faith. And Paul says if we don't have this, 1 Corinthians 15, please read the whole chapter when you get a chance, when you get home. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if we don't have this, we have nothing. If we don't have this, we are lost. But because we do have the physical resurrection, because we do have that true hope of the resurrection, we have hope for each day on this earth. And we can have real, true, bodily faith. And if you don't believe me, Paul just 
he couldn't help himself. And, and I need to share this with you, so bear with me. It's five verses long, but it's worth the time. And again, the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, after you get done 1 Corinthians 15, read 2 Corinthians 5 as well. But it's a reminder that this body, this body of aches and pains, this body of, of death, this body of hurts, of sadness, is going to be replaced with a new body, a new, more perfect one. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. It's not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. But while we are in this tent, we groan and we are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and who has given us this spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Guaranteeing what is to come. We are given the Holy Spirit so that we do not face each day on our own. We are given the Holy Spirit who continues to regenerate that faith within our hearts. We are given the Holy Spirit who continues to lead us to seek forgiveness, to seek the promise, to seek the hope. We are given the Holy Spirit to lead us to life eternal. What a promise our faith is. What a hope true faith is. And lest you think that I forgot that it is Mother's Day, let me talk about just for a moment some mothers from Scripture who had faith. There was this little lady by the name of Hannah. You maybe remember her. She was from the Old Testament and she had a husband by the name of Elkanah and apparently he needed two wives. Well, sadly, Hannah was barren, but his wife, or his other wife, though, was, was not barren. And year after year, as Scripture tells us, Hannah went to the temple. She prayed. Year after year, she was barren. Year after year, the other wife picked on her and gave her trouble, persecuted her. Year after year, she clung to the promises of God and made her vows at the temple. And finally, when the Lord was ready in his perfect timing, he gave her a little boy by the name of Samuel. If you think her wait was long, think about Sarah or Sarai. She even had a name change. She lived so long before having a child. Seventy years at the very least, probably longer than that. But at the age of 90, the Lord gave her Isaac. And take note, her faith did falter at times. Her faith did, she did wrestle with her faith. But that doesn't mean that she let go of her faith. And there's another mother from Scripture by the name of Mary, a scared little girl, barely in her teenage years, pregnant, scared to death. But she clung to the Lord, clung to his promises, and clung to faith, and bore the salvation of our world. And she had to have faith again, too, if you remember. Because at the foot of the cross, she knelt and she cried her tears. But she held on to that faith and she saw the resurrection of Christ her son. What a beautiful promise we have through these women. And, and when you think about it, think about your own mothers. And I'm not just speaking of your biological mothers, but maybe it's a mother here in church, uh, someone who has been a, an example to the faith. Maybe it's a lady who, or maybe you've been an example to someone else. And when you think of those pillars of faith, as we go through struggles, as we go through trials, as we wrestle with the inauthenticity at times, we look to those examples. We look to those examples of these women and men of faith. And we're reminded their lives were never perfect. Their lives weren't easy. At times they struggled with their faith. They struggled through it. And it reminds us that our lives are not going to be perfect. They're not going to be easy. At least not this side of eternity. But that we are meant to struggle with our faith. We're meant to wrestle with it. Because as we struggle with it, as we wrestle with it, it sharpens. And as Scripture shares in Hebrews, again, it becomes sharp like a two-edged sword. Because that is how the God's word, word works in our hearts. It is His Word that continues to cut away the lies, cut away the untruth, and remind us of the great truth. That because Christ Jesus rose physically and bodily, we too will rise. Amen.
Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for entering into our world and entering into our lives, for defeating sin, death, and the devil. And even though we cannot answer how or the why, help us to trust in you. Help us to have faith in you and to never let go because we know that you never let go. Lord, help us to continue to seek each and every day your guidance and direction. Help us to have the reassurance of your power in our lives. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to work within us so that we might know, we might know with full confidence that our salvation is guaranteed. And Lord, reassure us of that promise that as you have risen, we too shall rise. Alleluia. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.